Okay. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. We spend $4 trillion in the United States on healthcare every year. That's twice as much as our nearest industrialized country peer, and yet we have some of the lowest outcomes in the industrialized world. We have the lowest life expectancy, highest maternal and fetal mortality rates, highest avoidable death rate from preventable disease, and the third highest suicide rate, and yet we're spending twice as much as the industrialized world. We have an opportunity to do so much better. We believe that better healthcare starts when we stop waiting for people to get sick and take action on their health. My name is John Thornborough, I'm the managing partner of Cura Health Fund. I have 25 years experience as an entrepreneur and investor, and I have multiple returns in both of those roles. I have a track record of delivering financial results to stakeholders in the company that I'm involved in. I'm joined today by Beto Lopez, my co-managing partner. Beto is uh, suffering from Central Texas allergies and has lost his voice, but I do, I'm gonna call on him to, um, to do a couple of our slides. So he's drinking his tea and, and lemon, so hopefully he's gonna save his voice for the couple of areas we need him in for questions. Beto has over 20 years experience in design, developing products and services for some of the biggest brands, most recognizable brands in the world, and compelling experiences for consumers in healthcare and beyond. If you're like us, you'd welcome an opportunity to participate in a fund that delivers returns and impact, doing well and doing good at the same time. Cora Health Fund fosters and develops companies that are able to get to product market fit sooner, be more capital efficient in doing that, and deliver on the financial and impact results that they intend. We do that through our unique human-centered design um, experience and being very, very involved with our portfolio companies. So you might be saying, well, that all sounds great. How do you do that? Before we get into that, I want to tell you a story. This is Emily. Emily lives in rural Kansas and she's expecting her first child. She's in the clinic for her baby wellness check and first sonogram, but the nearest fetal echo sonographer lives over an hour and a half away and drives in every day to clinic when they're available to do scans. Emily missed her first appointment because the day that the sonographer was in clinic, she couldn't get off work. If Emily misses this crucial, wellness check, there's a chance that a serious issue that if missed could result in a costly and emotionally taxing intervention, such as a emergency C-section or even a post-delivery NICU stay. Now imagine Emily coming into the clinic at any time that's convenient for her and her scan is being done by any one of the physician's assistants or technicians in the clinic. Those scan images are uploaded to a cloud-based telesonography platform and are expertly interpreted by that same fetal echosonographer working from their home office. We've worked closely with one of our portfolio companies, BB Imaging, to develop just such a system. It's called Telescan. Telescan is being launched within our partner, our healthcare partner, HCA, and our co-invest, also part of HCA, called the Specialized Assets Group. Telescan is being launched into the HCA network to deliver these impact and returns to both BB Imaging, HCA, our partner, and also uh, to our fund. This is an example of what we think healthcare can look like, delivering optimal outcomes, improved health, and great returns as an investment. This is what we call doing well and doing good at the same time. So we'll talk more about BB Imaging as we go, but I wanna introduce you to our team. We've got the know-how and experience to grow companies to successful exits. And there's three major components of our experience. The first is domain expertise. We've worked in healthcare, tech, and design, and have built products and services that deliver stakeholder value time and again. As I mentioned, Beto has 20 years experience in design. He spent over 10 years at the world-renowned design firm IDEO, where he developed products and services for many of the leading brands in the world. 
He then moved to back to Austin to establish the Design Institute for Health at the University of Texas Medical, Dell Medical School. We also have operations expertise. Our venture partner, Trish Young Brown, has decades of experience in public health. She helped start the Austin Taxing Authority for Uncompensated Care and ran our federally qualified health center, Central Health, for over 10 years. Trish has got amazing contacts in the public health system in Texas A&M University System, Ascension Seton, and others. As mentioned, I've got a track record in entrepreneurship and investing. I've been involved in over 40 companies in my career in one of those roles, and I have an established track record of delivering returns at every stage. Now that you know a little bit about our team, I want to tell you about what we do. We seek to solve the hard problems first. You might be asking yourself, well, why would you want to do that? Why solve the hard problem? Why not start with the low-hanging fruit? Well, we do this intentionally, and we do it for several reasons. First, we seek opportunities in underserved markets. Underserved markets in healthcare are different. You might think of an underserved market as a consumer without an ability to pay. That's not the case in healthcare. In many areas of the country where either communities of color or rural communities that have barriers to access to care, they do have the ability to pay through our unique healthcare system, which has insured payers and public payers. So we seek to serve underserved markets also as a design choice. We're a human-centered design-oriented firm. That design choice helps us build resilient portfolios of companies that can then expand into the bulk of the market as they mature. You may have seen organizations that go after sort of the top 1% of the biohackers that have resources, and I'll put myself in that category, have the resources to seek aid when we have a special problem. But the vast majority of people in this country don't have that opportunity, yet those market sizes are orders of magnitude larger than the worried well. Many of the biohacking firms that start at the top of the market have, sometimes have a difficult time breaking out of that very tip top and getting into the bulk of the market. So we seek to, to serve underserved markets. We also focus on upstream prevention and wellness. Upstream prevention and wellness, by doing that, allows us to take out much of the, the cost of preventable illnesses in this country. We want to work with payers and health plans that are looking for opportunities to reduce cost and improve quality of service of care. So we focus on upstream prevention and wellness. We also work with ventures that are successful in today's work environment as well as tomorrow's. And what I mean by that, in, in today's healthcare system, we are largely a fee-for-service based system, right? We show up sick at the doctor, doctor treats us, doctor sends in the bill to the health insurance company, and we're responsible for our portion of that bill. That system is changing to more of a value-based care model where health plans want to have providers and hospital groups more incented to deliver on the outcomes for their patients. So our companies work in today's fee-for-service environment and are also positioned to thrive in the coming value-based care environment. By focusing on opportunities in underserved markets, focusing on upstream prevention and wellness, and developing companies that have the ability to work in a fee-for-service environment and a value-based care environment, we're building a future-facing, resilient portfolio that delivers impact and market returns. So now that you know a little bit about what we do, I want to talk about how we do it and see if Beto's voice is, uh, is up to it. So He's lost his voice, but he's going to try to get through this one. So we designed to de-risk. Uh, what does that mean exactly? So, so? so when you go upstream to markets that are underserved, it's very difficult to know the landscape of solutions because there are none. And so what you need to do if you're going to innovate in upstream markets is that you need a reliable and repeatable process. Human-centered design is just that. It's a repeatable process that can help you understand how to deliver valuable products and goods and services for people. The myth about human-centered design is that somehow you're being asked to go to your customer and ask them for the solution. 
in my experience, in the experience I had at IDO, not once did we ask the customer for the solution. You use human-centered design to understand the needs, the pains, the motivations that people have when, when their experiences are falling short of what they want. The important part of that is that when we incorporate that into our process, we very much learn what problems are worth solving. And that is something that most uh, funds, most incubators, most accelerators have a really hard time understanding. From all the problems in healthcare, what are the problems that you're gonna focus on? What are the problems you're gonna solve? And we use human-centered design to de-risk understanding market fit. I'm gonna go on to the next one. If you guys feel like you can hear me, if not, I'll ask John, but I can keep going at this let me, rate. Let me jump in and I'll just add an example here. You know, we've probably all seen examples of a problem looking for, or a solution looking for a problem or a product looking for a home. We start all the way back at the problem that we're trying to solve for. And if you think back to that example of Emily and Telescan and BB Imaging, the problem in access to rural communities is not necessarily a technological one. It's not a lack of technology. The problem that we started to solve there was the fact that a highly skilled sonographer in clinic has to do both the scanning and the interpretation of the scan. So the first innovation, the problem is that we have very few fetal echo sonographers in this country. There's about 3,000 fetal echo sonographers for the 4 million live births that we have in the United States. So we have a shortage in the market of a very highly skilled um, technical person in these sonographers. The first innovation and the problem we were solving is how do we make best use of that very scarce resource of sonographers? We did that by working with BB Imaging first to discover how could we separate the, call it the image acquisition from the image interpretation, right? How does the sonographer capture the image of the anatomy? Currently, they do it by somebody who knows what they're looking for, scanning the anatomy of, of a woman and taking still images of the anatomy that they want. What we were able to help BB Imaging innovate was the ability to take a video scan of the anatomy, have an AI or ML-based machine learning process parse that video, and then serve the images to the sonographer that they could then use to write that report. By doing this, we're allowing a lower skilled technician to do the scans in clinic and allowing this, the, the more scarce sonographer to have the highest and best use of their time. So it's really not a technology looking for a home. It's solving the problem first and then following with the technology. So, um, Bet, do you want to give, a, give it a go on people or I can keep going? I'll give it a try. Um, to know healthcare right now is to know that the entirety of the US healthcare system is built around the who, not the what. And as John explained, you really have to understand that healthcare is the delivery and orchestration of a lot of work. And to deliver value, you have to create meaningful experiences, not just for the patient, but for the clinician, the staff, the administrators, and even the payers. All of them are seeking to figure out how to understand the value that you're bringing to the market. And it's just not about creating that for patients. So when we think about working in healthcare, when we think about investing in ideas and problems, it's more than just understanding what's missing. It's understanding how we're going to incorporate that into the workflows that deliver those innovations in the places where people get health. The important part for us is that to, to do this well, you really have to understand the value of prototyping and co-creating alongside people. And the next bit, John, if you go to the next one, is that we fundamentally rethought how to co-create with partners. And that's to say that in many ways, you cannot disrupt healthcare out of itself. There's a common notion around bringing a blockbuster slayer type innovation into healthcare. At the peak, Blockbuster had 9,000 stores and Redbox and Netflix were able to disrupt them. But healthcare has over 1 million physicians, over 5 million nurses, over 1,200 
primary care medical practices, over 6,000 hospitals. There's no way we're going to disrupt all of those things out of existence. What we have to do is radically collaborate to evolve them because we need to figure out how to deliver the care that people want in the places that they're already going. And for us, partnering with, um, as John mentioned, Healthcare Corporation of America, HCA, that's a valuable thing because they have the channels and the environments in which stuff like Telescan can reach the people who need it. Otherwise, you're recreating those systems and aren't able to actually realize impact quickly. Thanks, Beto. So by solving problems early and understanding the people that we're solving them for and nurturing partners to co-create success, we seek to de-risk our ventures, get to product market fit faster, have more capital efficiency in the growth of our companies, and realize our return profile. Our model is unique. We pair our fund with a venture studio called Design Run. Design Run is where the capability of human-centered design lives, and it has a couple of advantages by pairing it with the with the uh, the fund. Design Run is the manager of Cura Health Fund, and the team in Design Run is the same team in Cura, so they're very closely aligned and affiliated. Design Run just works on the front end of that venture development process to help start to de-risk some of that early stage venture risk. Cura, as a traditional fund, gets a chance to watch the development of those companies and invest at a later stage when some of that risk is taken out of the equation. So the benefit to the core of fund LPs is the ability to watch the development and get to the advantage of some of that de-risking. The second advantage is that Design Run has its own earned revenue model so that there's no additional drag on the fund economics by having Design Run in the process. This allows us to de-risk and develop a highly proprietary deal flow for the fund and deliver on the economics that we want to deliver. So we've talked about uh, a little bit about myself and Beto. I mentioned Trisha's experience. Trisha's our venture partner. She's got 30 years experience as a C-suite executive in, in public health, uh, tremendous contacts in the industry and really understands in particular those payer models. When our companies, and I'll talk about this when we get to the portfolio, when our companies are working with the payers in the system to add value reduce costs and increase their outcomes. Trish has got a lot of experience in that area. Lucas Artuzzi is a venture partner with over 10 years in design. He worked with Beto at IDEO and also at the Dell Medical School. Dennis Kavner is an advisor. He's a 35 year entrepreneur and community activist who ensures that we're merging our, perfect, our purpose with our prosperity. We work in the digital health space. It's an enormous market. There's four major verticals in digital health. The first is telehealth, which has really exploded after the pandemic. Uh, telehealth market was about $4 billion prior to the pandemic and is now over 200 billion. Much of that is now becoming part of the permanent infrastructure of medical healthcare delivery. Uh, there's also the digital treatments, health coaching and wellness and digital care management segments. We operate in telehealth and digital care management currently, and we're looking for opportunities in the other two segments. So it's an enormous over $300 billion market opportunity. And we see plenty of opportunity not only to improve the way healthcare is delivered, but also have really fantastic returns. We're an early stage investor. We like to get in pre-seed or seed really when those entrepreneurs are at the kitchen table or in the garage working on their very initial concept, we want to be involved in early stage. Sorry, Hall, I had my uh, participants um, minimized. I didn't see your hand up. Do you have a question? Yes, I, the question I had was, telehealth is a very big um, space. Where in there do you find the best investment opportunities? What do you look for? Well, at, on the front end, we talked about one of our portfolio companies, BB Imaging. And where we're looking for telehealth is really to serve uh, those marginalized communities, underserved communities, rural communities, communities of color. As an example, in this country, um, you know, I talked on the top about the, the disparate outcomes we have in this country. The maternal 
mortality rate for a woman, a black woman in this country is four times that of a white woman. And in some geographies and boroughs of, say, New York, it's 10 times that of a white woman. So telehealth can be really instrumental in expanding the market for services in those areas that are not being served today. And the example we use with BV Imaging is by having a telecell, telesonography service, we're reaching areas that aren't being served. So we're actually expanding the market for service. And that's much of what is done in telehealth. So we're looking to serve underserved communities to expand the market for service and also do it very, um, very cost effectively. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, we are focused in the technology enabled services space. Services are where healthcare is delivered. We're not in therapeutics that are going to be going through rigorous clinical trials and spending a decade in, in FDA approval. We want to be on the forefront where healthcare is delivered, and tech enabled services is that focus for us. Our current investment profile is between 100,000 to 200,000 per company over the lifetime. I'll get into more of the portfolio construction in a few minutes, but I first want to talk about a couple of our other portfolio companies. And you might note that um, BV Imaging, we'll talk about more in a second. We are here. These are companies that are fairly well developed. We're a relatively new fund, but we warehoused a couple of our deals and even before we launched the funds, so we've got multi-year relationships with these companies. We are here is a marketplace for those living with cancer. It's an early stage company that provides care navigation and a multi-sided marketplace to serve the everyday needs of cancer. What that means is everybody on this call probably knows somebody that has had cancer or has had cancer themselves and a diagnosis can throw a person's life into turmoil, causing emotional overwhelm and financial distress, medical, Debt is the single largest reason for bankruptcy in this country. Medical debt is the single largest contributor of bankruptcy in this country. And a cancer diagnosis can throw somebody into financial distress. We Are Here provides care navigation and connection to products and services that people need to reduce their level of emotional overwhelm and their financial distress. And this has been shown to have an impact on their health outcomes. So we are working with the company to first uh, go to market in an employee supplemental benefits where they're providing the service to employers for their employee populations. But ultimately the company will move to a payer model where a payer wants to cover their covered population by having this care navigation service available. The company has made good progress so far. They've started seeing patients last year. They achieved first revenue in Q3 of last year, and they've served over 300 and 350 people so far. They're in early um, stages with two employers to provide navigation service for those employers, and also two major nonprofits providing the service for them as well. We're really happy with the progress of the company so far. We've already talked about Telescan and BB Imaging. Um, that is a cloud-based telesonography platform that's launched into HCA um, along with our co-investor special assets group. And I want to talk a little more about sort of the progress that they've made. So they achieved FDA clearance in Q3 of last year. They did their first telescan uh, paid revenue in October of last year, and they're in pilot with HCA in four locations. We don't have a mark on this company yet or, or an uplift in the valuation because they did a venture debt round in Q3, Q4 of last year. But we, if we mark this today, we would probably be at a two and a half or three X our original investment. We're in at a $10 million post money valuation and we're very happy with the progress so far. And any investors that are in this portion of fund one will obviously get all the benefit of, of the progress we've made in the company so far. The last company in the portfolio I want to talk about is Mother Goose. Mother Goose was started by a 20-year OBGYN professional, Dr. Ken Levy, uh, out of New York, who saw the challenge of being able to only see his patients for 15 minutes every couple of months. There was no, no way for him to be able to really closely assess which of those patients were at risk of severe complications that could lead to those expensive ER visits or NICU stays. So he developed Mother Goose as 
a sort of an overlay care navigation process where a group of healthcare professionals, uh, a nurse, a lactation consultant, and doula, and, and a OB-GYN are watching over a cohort of pregnant individuals throughout that journey using an AI-based uh, algorithm and tool to help surface serious issues among patients. So if, if the patient, for instance, is developing early onset of hypertension or high blood pressure during pregnancy, they can send, for instance, a remote patient monitoring device, a, a, a blood pressure cuff with the patient to the home to be able to monitor their blood pressure and then be able to react more quickly to high risk cases, thus reducing these downstream costs. So the company is squarely at the nexus of working with payers, providers, and patients in order to bring this value to the market. Cura uh, participated in the early seed round of the company and the company started seeing first patients last year and they're in pilot in four practices in the Northeast and have seen over 150 patients. So we're really pleased with the progress of the company so far. So I'll talk a little bit about the portfolio construction and the terms. This is an early fund. It's a $5 million fund and we're seeking to invest in six to eight companies like the ones we've already described. We think our investment return over the life of the fund will be three to four X multiple on invested capital. And we're in, in the midst of the two to three year investment period of the 10 year fund. We have a traditional two and 20 model, just like most other funds and what's called a European waterfall, which is a very investor favorable term which means that investors will get all of their capital back before the general partner starts to participate in any of the carried interest. So we think it's a fair and reasonable approach. Now, this is an early fund and we don't yet have any marks. So you might be asking yourself, well, what's the track record of this team? Well, I have delivered on investments in my own portfolio. Uh, I've listed those as investor returns here. I've had 12 exits as an executive or an operator or an investor. And these are my direct investor returns over the last eight or nine years. That's a realized return of 23% and a multiple on invested capital 2.7x. These aren't cherry pick deals. These are all the deals that I did and all the returns that I've gotten in that case. Some people ask me, well, you've got 12 exits, but only six are listed. The, other, the others are as an executive or an operator or entrepreneur where I'm getting that stock right as a founder at, at, at little or no basis. So it's basically like an infinite IRR. It's not really an investor equivalent kind of metric, but these are my um, investor exits. I've had one IPO that was a result of a turnaround uh, organization up in the Seattle area in the medical product space and multiple private equity and public sponsor acquisitions over the years. So we feel like we have a major opportunity in the US healthcare market. We have a differentiated model with proprietary deal flow using a really unique human-centered design approach. And we have an experienced team that delivers the results, the financial returns and the impact in health that we seek. We realize that investing is a relationship business. So if you'd like to keep in contact with us or set up some time separately to visit with the team, get into more detail on our portfolio, we would welcome that or you can continue to monitor progress on the 10 Capital Network. Thanks for your time. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, we did have a question in the audience that I think Beto answered about uh, telehealth and also Bob Jacoby's uh, question about, uh, do you invest in diagnostics as well? Um, go ahead, Beto. Do you want to feel that one you got, you got for it in, in terms of diagnostics? Well, I've, I've put in, uh... I've put in a response in the chat, um, but for sure, diagnostics are actually an, uh, a rather underserved area. We think about them mostly as a way to channel people to treatment, but diagnostics are actually much bigger than that. And as you think about population health and epidemiology, we really need to approach diagnostics as a surrogate to get into prevention. That really is where we can start addressing the unsustainable costs of healthcare and redirect people from uh, the notion that they have to wait to get sick to consider the alternatives of how they can approach their health. Um, so diagnostics is a very big space. It's very interesting to us. And we're very much looking at a number of different things in there. And also telehealth, 
is a very important channel and it's not going to go away, but it doesn't replace the continuum of healthcare. Healthcare is made up of different ways in which you can interact with healthcare professionals and telehealth will fundamentally change things, but it's not a replacement for the hospital where you need to get your appendix out. It's not a replacement for how you think you have to approach um, uh, aspects of um, prevention and wellness that aren't being solved through um, telehealth modules themselves. So I, it, it's, it's, it's very important, but it's not the end all. I, I wish I could say more, but I can't because I can't <laughs> Don't try to say more. Thanks, really. Beto. Paul, any other questions? Yes, you talked about the shift to value-based healthcare and been hearing about that for the last five years. What impact do you see that on the investor returns? Is it increasing, decreasing, or just shifting to different areas or no change at all? It's a great question. You know, the, the shift to value-based care is real and it's also really moving very slowly in some ways. So as I talked about, our portfolio has to be able to work in today's fee-for-service environment, but also thrive in that coming value-based care environment. And for us, it's a real opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to shift the revenue seeking opportunity to that, you know, where is the payer receiving uh, the increased outcomes and reducing their costs? There is still much your know, revenue opportunity in that. There was um, a recent study that showed that University of Alabama found that patients who had care navigation, they could reduce their cost by over $720 per patient from care navigation services, we are here is able to offer those care navigation services at around $400 currently in their unit economics, and that's coming down drastically. So that's a revenue opportunity that's purely from the value that's brought by care navigation, increasing outcomes and reducing costs. So there's tremendous revenue opportunity and, and business building opportunity in value-based care. It's just, it's slow, right? Companies, organizations, providers, and hospital groups are still really trying to figure out how they're going to work in the value-based care environment. So as things are shifting, we're looking for opportunities. Mother Goose is in the value-based care space. We are here is in the value-based care space, um, but they're currently proving their outcomes. We know e the economics work for both of those companies. Great. Well, we have a couple of questions in the chat box that I, I can go and read out. Do you see functional medicine converging into allopathic medicine? I think I'm gonna let Beto field that one. You're on mute, Beto. I put in the in the chat too. Um, look, we're already seeing functional medicine appear in kind of the, the niche family practices where it's where it's being where it's augmenting traditional medicine. The important part about functional medicine is that it can very much be brought into uh, everyday healthcare when we start considering it as part of bundles that value-based care will actually use as part of its ability to address a larger market need, which is that today in the fee-for-service market, we're not actually getting people better. We're just treating them. But functional methods, as well as traditional methods, can actually be used in packaged ways. Think about repackaging the way in which your physician or your care provider actually creates a, a clinical pathway for you to recover. Those are the things that feel more appealing for us because when the payment model changes, it really doesn't matter what the clinician is, is or has been billing for. It's whatever is, 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 is meaningfully um, creating an outcome, uh, an evidence-based result of an improved outcome. And those are the things that are going to be bundled into and packaged for providers to offer their, their, their patients. Thanks, Beto. Appreciate it. And Katrina's question, do we invest in MedTech in Africa? We are currently U.S.-based only. We don't invest uh, internationally. And my next question is, what do you consider, what is your criteria for a successful investment in healthcare? What, what do you look for to make sure, say, that was success? So given our um, focus in a relatively small portfolio, from a financial standpoint, we underwrite so that any given company can provide a 10x return on the investment. So that on a portfolio basis, we're delivering on that three to four X, but we are impact oriented. We want to understand what are the outcomes that each company is producing so that it's sustainable and real, right? So it's both financial and it's impact oriented or outcomes oriented. 
So we have to understand really at the outset, what are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and what's the financial um, capabilities to for that investment. But we know we can do both. Healthcare is so much opportunity in investing. You know, we know that we can underwrite for a 10X on any given deal, return our fund uh, economics and achieve the outcomes, the health outcomes that we're looking for. We have another question in the chat box about long COVID. It's a new syndrome and quite similar to other illnesses. Is this a good opportunity for med startups to pursue long COVID? It, yeah, for sure, but that's that. Um, and an interesting point for us, um, that, that's more of a pharmacological pathway to innovation. You're, you're going to need to develop not just new protocols to identify long COVID, but you're going to need to develop pharmacological approaches, therapies for them. And in our practice, we really look to identify ways in which underserved communities are not getting promising solutions. So if someone out there is going to develop that pharmacological approach, I think what's fascinating about that is how do you then get that into communities that need it the most? And right now, the distribution channels are really challenging because of a complex political environment where, um, you know, vaccines are not immediately thought of as a solution. They've been politicized in a way that it's not clear that everybody should get one. And so when we start creating therapeutics for long COVID, there's a campaign, there's a communications campaign required to address that as well. And for us, what we feel is important about this is that underserved communities really do need to be addressed in the ways that we create pathways for those innovations to reach them. Great. Thanks. My next question is, is now a good time to invest in healthcare, especially telehealth? Is it too late or too soon? Or do you have any, any thought about timing on these different trajectories. During the pandemic, it seemed like telehealth was off the charts. It's uh, coming down a little bit now, but still the, the long haul is there as well. What's your take on timing there? Yeah, so that's a great question and really relates to all the digital health space. Telehealth in particular has exploded. But if you sort of look at venture capital investing as a way of developing opportunities, investable opportunities in that market, we saw a big spike in investing across the board in 2022 and in, in digital or in the telehealth space prior in 2022 was about 3 billion 2021 uh, was 7 billion. So, you know, we saw it spike up and we saw it come back down, but it was really on the same basis of the prior year. So spend of uh, venture capital investing is about 3 billion, but the market opportunity has grown significantly, but that's across the board this last year in 2022, was a challenging year across the board, but the advantage for investors that have capital is that we're seeing valuations lower, right? The, the valuations have adjusted that are down. So we're seeing as an investment opportunity, companies that are having, to, that are really being more realistic about their valuations and we're building our portfolio at those lower valuations now. So from an investment standpoint, it's a great time to be working in this space. Telehealth, digital health are going to continue to grow um, significantly. The telehealth market is expected to grow at a 5% rate, I think, over the next six to seven years, according to a pitch book digital health report I saw recently. So it's large. It's not going you know, back to pre-pandemic levels by any mean, um, and it will continue to grow. So it's, it's a great space, has really good opportunities. And for us now, it's a good time to be investing. That's great. Well, that's it for the uh, questions we have at this point. We would like to bring up a uh, company to pitch and get your feedback from, John. Uh, it's called Health Connects, and we have Al Fasola here today. Al, if you could go ahead and uh, come up and put your pitch up on the screen and tell us more about it. And, John, looking forward to your feedback here. Thanks, everybody. Al, Appreciate the time, Jay. Go ahead. All right, so I've been pinching myself for the last half hour. I, I don't know whether to apply for a job. Uh, for you guys or to invest in your fund um, or to pitch you to invest in ours. Uh, I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of people. Uh, I don't know whether it's the gray hair or what it is, but as you describe yourself, 
Um, I just want to say it's very inspiring to hear uh, people who are capital providers discuss the world uh, the way you do when you talk about double bottom lines, when you talk about underserved communities. Our mindset is very, very similar. Um, we are all here because we have had mental health experiences in our family, in our friends, in our colleagues at church. And we believe there's a lot of people that should be here with us today that are not. And the reason that they're not is we do not have, as an example with breast cancer, we don't have universal screening for mental health that makes sense. And therefore, you used to get breast cancer at stage four when you recognize that you have it. Unfortunately, that's happening to our society now with mental health issues that go undetected for extraordinarily long periods of time. And then when the hand does go up, it takes now months to be able to get to a, to a provider. During that 80 days, nothing good happens. Addiction happens, violence toward others happens, and the ultimate uh, solution to mental health is dying from suicide, which is why our life expectancy is down. And we believe that the key issues that surround this are detectable with a very short but broad array screening program that takes the eight principal factors that create a early look at a mental health risk. And we design a digital method where we create a new vital sign, but not in the doctor's office like blood pressure, but before the patient even comes into an encounter. We have eight key factors. They're administered through a proprietary system. We call this emoji. These are genetically enhanced emojis where you have control. The patient has control not to rate themselves, but to use a slider bar to marry their face to the facial image that continues to move. And in the back, that's being collected, scored, and within five tenths of a second, when the patient hits submit, we're able to see the risk score, much like a FICO score, where it, of course, measures credit worthiness. What we're trying to ascertain on a triage basis is what is the probability and the risk of this person moving into mental health and what that impact is on chronic disease as early as possible. We know that less than 2% of all the patients are, are administering a PQR4 or a GAD9 or a UCLA loneliness test. The tests that you would have to take to compare with ours would be 17 minutes. We know nobody fills them out. We know nobody reads them. And therefore you look to an EHR, but you find that 90% of the data you need on a mental health case is not there because it's been done outside of network. And it's a, it's a tragedy. And our whole belief system is if we can keep create a faster, better, cheaper, methodology for screening, then that will tell the providers what type of interventions and diagnostics they then have to use. If in a value-based environment, they have 30% of their panel that's diabetic, and it shows only 2% of them are depressed, we know that's wrong. We know that's likely to be 18%, and somebody who is comorbid with depression and diabetes is gonna cost three times as much. So we want to be able to signal to the whole care team what patients are at the highest risk because you can't treat everybody the same way. So, you know, we believe the whole society is underserved population. And so what can we do to be able to deal with this crazy graph that says we are getting more mental health claims over the last 12 months than all other claims put together? So is there any wonder why suicide, addiction, and violence is out of control? Is there any wonder why it's gone from one in 30 days to one in 80 days before you can match this supply and demand imbalance? So we know we're not smart enough or we'll ever be big enough 
to get enough emoji screenings out there to get the validation of data that we need to make more precise analytics and become more prescriptive. Therefore, we're going with partners. Um, DocsyMe has 30% of the telehealth market. Uh, when, the when COVID hit, their business grew by 5,000% per quarter. Uh, they're now sitting with a million providers, both psychologists and primary care. Their new product, which is called DocBot, is a chatbot. They have selected our screening tool uh, after having evaluated 20 others, and we are now getting married to their chatbot, which is going to be their new intake valve for information. So we're working with them on a freemium product for the first 120 days, and then we're adding two premium features on top of that, hopefully to follow their same conversion rate, which has allowed them to have 60 million a year uh, consistent revenue uh, and 25 million in net income. So we will be in addition uh, to their business, both with existing customers that they have, but more importantly, they want us to go into primary care to add volume there. I'm not going to bore you guys with this because I don't believe any of this. Uh, we're business people. We've all run businesses. Four of us are grandfathers. We use our own money until such time as we believe in what the path forward is going to be. And we are now at that path. We know we've experimented with RX in a contract with SureScripts to see where the behavioral data and the RX data comes together. While that's interesting, and there's another a variety of applications, but we are doubling and tripling down on telehealth because we have the differentiator. For Doxy, we're the gateway to see what type of assessments they need. We have an alpha users who, who's run his psychology practice for two years. We've got the data that we need that shows when you bring depression and loneliness down, pain comes down too, and you're not even treating for it. So that's the emotional quantity of pain. Um, let me just show you our team. Um, so everybody here is committed to mental health screening and value-based care. There isn't a person on our team that has less than 30 years experience in startups, in, in healthcare, and in uh, technology. Uh, we have a strong medical staff, technology staff. Uh, we've got exceptional people on deal making, marketing, and the kind of deep channel partnering that's going to get us to where we need to be. So let me pause and uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Al. John, did you have any questions for him? I'm going to see if Beto wants to go first. Do you have any initial Questions, comments, Beto? I, I, I put my comment in the chat, but Alfred, the 3,000% the increase slide is a great example for everybody on the call to understand that healthcare is supply side driven. Before COVID, we had restrictions on being able to access telehealth services for mental health needs. When those restrictions were lifted, we saw that 3,000% spike because people actually needed those services, but they weren't actually available to them because access was restricted. Healthcare works as a supply side capitated ecosystem. When we understand that the needs that people have aren't reflected in the production of care, then we can begin to understand all the different opportunities that exist to innovate in healthcare, much like the one that you're presenting today. I couldn't agree more. That, that, that math sounds simple, but no, while nobody could predict COVID would create the landslide for telehealth, nobody can predict now what this building tidal wave of mental health issues is going to occasion for us as an industry. Whether it's government driven or simply market driven, now the telehealth is here to stay. You're putting the provider one step further from the patient. 
And it's highly likely that if Emily had taken an emoji, she would have been able to get off work and make that appointment because the, the feelings and the emotions that go with pregnancy are such that they should not be trifled with. And being able to monitor somebody as they go through these things and after delivery are equally important to what other physical health uh, challenges that the mother experiences. Thanks, Alfred. I, I think the comment that I have um, in the question, uh, clearly mental health is an epidemic proportions in this country. It is a huge issue. You saw in our pitch, the third highest suicide rate in the United States in the industrialized world, and it's getting worse, um, uh, particularly among young people, young women in particular. So the problem is clear. The, the path to how you're going to realize outcomes in the market through you know, assessment and evaluation, assuming that you've got all that solved, which it looks like you do, how do you connect the dots between the intervention, right, the assessment to ultimately how you're changing outcomes for people? It, it, what's the success rate in connecting them to services? And then by doing that, how can you measure their improvement in mental health? We're always looking for not just the, the interim solution that works, what's the ultimate outcome downstream that you can demonstrate then you know, is having an effect to your population because ultimately that's, you know, unless you have a pair source like Doxy who's gonna pay you on a per evaluation basis, you need to be able to demonstrate outcomes so that you can then go to the payer source ultimately to, to show reduction in cost and improved health outcomes. So connecting those dots for me would have been helpful in your presentation. So let's try that now, John, because that's a great question. And I go back to the comment that Beto made about a, an innovation in healthcare has to address the whole ecosystem. Otherwise your outcomes are gonna be distorted and you won't be able to get the kind of trends you need you know, for machine learning. So we are not an assessment and we are not evaluation and we don't get into diagnostics, what we do is provide a gateway, almost a triage for those pieces to work together. So it's not just the scoring that we do. Mm -hmm. Although we have found in patients that take the emoji, and unfortunately we didn't have time to actually for you to take that demo, but if you're interested, I would uh, advise you to do that. It has an amazing effect on people. Uh, the younger, the better. And that effect is they are seeing themselves in a way that they have never seen themselves before. And because it's so engaging and quick and measurable, they want to take it time and again, and we found that they're sending it to others. Now, ultimately, we think the Hawthorne effect is into play here, that you get a more willing patient to understand that the behavioral health is got a tremendous impact on their physical health. And now you've got the provider who has a mirror image of what that patient has described. And so therefore on a population basis or one patient at a time, we have action buttons. Those action buttons direct a patient to various self-help resources if they can't get to a provider and it also directs the provider to tell us where they want that patient to go if they're in extremis. So the combination of the frequency of the emoji combined with the tracking and the action buttons allow us to determine over time what interventions are working for which cohorts of patients. Mm. And then that gives us a very serious tool to certainly move from free to to premium. Got you. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to follow up on this in a later call. I saw a deal recently out of the UK that was using a similar emoji kind of tool to assess team morale within the enterprise. So they took it a different direction. It's not, it wasn't a fit for us, obviously, but if you're interested in learning more about sort of how they applied it, happy to share that and happy to jump on a call. I can follow up with Hall later on that. I didn't, I couldn't reply to the little online deal because uh, I'm a host, but I'll follow up and, and we'll set up a, a call. Thank you, Alfred. I'd look forward to it. Thank you, gentlemen. Ed, 
Al, one last thing. If you look in the chat box, Beto gave you a nice uh, comment there about another thing to consider is the emerging landscape that the Mental Health Parity Act is helping reshape this space as well. We'll capture that for you as well. All right, go ahead. Let's go to the next one. Um, uh, uh, Bentley, let's have you come up as well. And uh, let's have you show your screen and uh, let's, let's go through your presentation also. So okay, cool. So uh, my name is Bentley Adams. I'm the founder and CEO of Way. Um, I think before I dive into uh, what Way is and kind of how it works and where we're at, I, I, oft, I often find that it's best to start with kind of the journey and how we got here and what the little bit of background about me. So uh, I'll dive into that if that's okay with everybody. Um, sure. So the, uh, the journey really started for me when I was in college. A professor of mine told me that two thirds of people in this country were going to live a life of pain and suffering due to preventable chronic conditions. And that just stopped me dead in my tracks. I'm an Eagle Scout. I took an oath to do a duty to this country at a young age. As happy as that might sound or as messy as things are like they are right now, I always took that very seriously. So when I heard that and ever since that moment, impacting health has been my, my personal focus or my professional focus. And so my first love actually was um, uh, in functional movement and body movement, helping people move in alignment with their natural structures and seeing how when they did they'd be happier and they'd report back and saying they're better to their, their partner, their spouse, their friends, their coworkers, the strangers on the street. And that gave me a really deep sense of reward. Uh, it's definitely the deepest sense of reward I felt professionally since then. Um, and, and at any point in time in my career. And so I actually wanted to be a doctor. My mentor who was a doctor and an Olympic athlete trainer said, don't do it. It's not what you think it's going to be. Um, you're going to have to care for people the way that the system wants you to, not the way that you want to, which he knew would be really confining for me. And so I went to the business side of healthcare and there's an observation that underlies way um, that I had along the way. But ultimately, uh, I started off, you know, alongside of the career I was at KPMG, I audited Medicaid for the state of California, naively thinking I could learn the system from the inside and make change that way. And then went to Beckman Coulter, which is the first company that did blood testing on humans in a reliable, scalable way about 85 years ago. Um, so laboratory touches every area of healthcare, learned a ton, ran New York at a young age. I was like 20 years younger than everybody. And was number one in the U.S. and realized that corporate healthcare probably wasn't going to be how we were going to make change. So at the time, a neighbor of mine was a principal at a venture capital firm in New York called Accretive, um, which was riding high. They had created Fandango from scratch. And in 2011, in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, had one of only, at that time, 36 companies that had um, uh, had a a privately held company with over a billion dollar valuation. And so now there's over 1,200 of them, but uh, we had, they'd want to take that model and put it into laboratory. So I became the fourth member of the founding team of that company, uh, grew very fast, ended up having a over $100 million exit, um, but didn't make a dent. And so uh, the next company I'd created was a digital marketing agency focused on the consumerization of healthcare. So getting products and services to people quicker. Um, had clients like, you know, OneMedicalHealthline.com, Life Technologies, Sequinom, Trovigy, and some amazing clients. It was an Inc. 500 company, but ultimately didn't make a dent. And so I came back to this thing that I knew, which is that nutrition is the single biggest factor to each person's overall health. And that's not really debated by pretty much every scientist, every doctor, every dietitian, every trainer, anyone who studies the human body knows that nutrition is um, the biggest factor. And so there was just something that I had done on the side of my uh, professional, you know, my corporate and venture life. I was a trainer at Equinox in New York. And there was a fundamental truth that my mentor in college had taught me. And so I incorporated it naturally into my routine. Uh, and this is kind of where way came from. But what he said was that you can't really ever tell somebody what to do and create long-term behavior change. You can, that you can tell them what to do and they might get three or six months or 12 months of behavior change. But to make something last for years or for a lifetime, they really have to make their own decisions. You can show them, but it's that agency that really creates the long-term shift. And in order to create that, I had developed my own technique, which was creating emotional rapport. So for functional movement, creating neuromuscular mirroring or showing people what they're doing in order for them to make their own observations and their own decisions in practice. But I'd bring clients in. It was really simple. I'd say, you know, hey, John, how was your day? What did you do? How was the stress? How are the portfolio companies? How's that guy Bentley? Was he being a jerk? Blah, blah, blah. You know, what did you eat for lunch? And invariably, three things would happen. The client would become aware of what they ate when they wouldn't have otherwise. Two, they immediately knew whether what they ate was good or not good for them. And three by five, six or seven o'clock at night or the next day when I'd see them, they knew how their body felt as a result of what they ate. So they already had all the information. They just needed to become aware of it. So I would write it down. They'd start getting more curious about it. I'd focus on the functional movement patterns. 
And we'd see these shifts. And about six years later, when I was starting this journey, I'd call up those old clients and over 80% of them had kept that shift. And so that's a crazy high percentage. Normally you maybe get 10% adherence in that, you know, over a six year time horizon. And so that's really where Way was born from. It was, I'd taken that observation and then talked to some of the best intuitive eating dietitians in the U.S. who are now working with us and some of the best behavior science people at Columbia and at Duke at Dan Ariely School of Advanced Hindsight. And uh, they have the same fundamental technique. We just have more behavior modeling behind it. And so that's really where Way was born. And I'll walk through some of the slides now too, of just kind of like the basics of what Way is. So the problem that Way really solves is that restrictive diets fail. They fail at least 83% of the time. Some studies go as high as 97%. So the reason why they fail ultimately is that they're creating poor incentives, but they're really getting people into a restrict binge cycle. And so restriction on a restrictive diet leads to deprivation or disconnection from the body signals. And that deprivation eventually leads into a binge eating uh, episode. That binge eating almost invariably leads into shame or guilt. So shame in the Brene Brown sense of feeling of unworthy of being a belonging or of love or of connection or guilt, you know, effectively feeling like I'm not living up to my own values. Shame or guilt or both then lead back to restriction. And then that restriction goes to more deprivation, more binge, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a vicious cycle that very many people, over 120 million people in the US are in right now. And that's really what way is, is here to address and what it does. We use very proven modalities helping people. Um, it's, a, it's an intuitive nutrition app that helps people find peace in their relationship with food and their body. We do it through intuitive eating. And we do that, take that intuitive eating and put it into the cognitive behavioral therapy framework. And so thoughts lead to emotions and feelings that lead to behaviors that reinforce the thoughts. We get right between the thoughts and emotions and feelings behind the behaviors and create what's called a peace point using a magic wand question. It's a powerful behavioral question, but it's basically if you could wave a magic wand right now and find peace in your relationship with food and your body, what would that feel like? What would that look like? What would you notice in your surroundings? What would you, how would you feel about your body? And when that picture is in somebody's mind, just like in dialectic behavioral therapy or in addiction therapy, they're able to map just naturally the thoughts and emotions and feelings to that picture and the behaviors follow. And so that's really how we go about making change. It's important to know upfront what way is and what it's not. So what it is, it's a safe, non-judgmental place. You can't really create long-term, we believe we can't create long-term shift unless somebody really feels like they're safe, like they're in a parasympathetic nervous system versus a sympathetic nervous system. And so we also are accessible at $6.99 a month or $49.99 annually. Um, we really wanted to make sure that it's available to as many people as possible, taking very exclusive modalities currently and bringing forth to large masses. And so uh, as well, I think the uh, important to note that there's a very uh, proven efficacy behind the modalities we're using. So intuitive eating has over 150 clinical studies, CBT from Aaron and Beck almost hundred years ago. It's really an ancient technique, but he's the one that formalized it. And it's one of the bedrocks of all of our understanding of behavior change and mental health change. And so what we're not, we are not any sort of restrictive diet, looking, smelling, or tasting thing. As soon as we get there, then people fall off. They think that this is just another restrictive diet. And very many consumers are very sensitive to that line of what looks like diet culture and what doesn't. So there's no weighing people. There's no restrictive programs. We, we're very careful to not trigger people back into the restrict binge cycle. Um, the way the journey starts, it's effectively, you know, users begin a journey. They go through 54 core modules that are two to eight sessions, two to eight minutes long in each of these, in each of these sessions. And then, um, Ultimately, where we're going to is creating more personalization over time. So where will the, the product map actually goes to is extending user life through personalizing both what sessions users see, but then ultimately also creating in real time, eventually sessions that are um, bespoke to each, uh, each user as they're going through their process. We have an amazing team, some of the best dietitians in the United States and behavior scientists in the United States as well behind us. Some great investors like Esther Dyson, who's one of the more prolific angels in all of tech over the last 30 years, uh, as well as, again, Kara Harb Street is one of the intuitive eating thought leaders in the U.S. On our team, Frank Bach, who's the head designer for Headspace, uh, some amazing engineers, and um, Dr. Marta Shea Sador is a quadruple board certified uh, psychiatrist from Columbia University, Dr. Julie Miller's. Um, uh, one of the uh, PhD from Dan Ariely School of Advanced Hindsight at Duke. And so 
We've had some pretty amazing traction since we launched last April. We've been focused on the quality of our growth, so increasing retention. So we're now at 78% month-over-month retention. Our head of pro- our product uh, advisor, our key one, was the head of product of my fitness pal, um, and we're lucky to have him, but what he said is compared to even where they're at at 14% or at uh, Matt My Fitness at 22%. We're significantly higher retention, although discounting for scale, it will come down, but it's still very, very high. We're already positive on our gross margin at 55.8%. Uh, so we're acquiring people, even though we're not in diet or weight loss, we're acquiring people from there. And so we want to make sure we're doing it efficiently, which we've, we've proven we are. And we, we think like we can get that even to be even better. Um, we're raising a $1.1 million round. We've already closed 800,000 of it. We believe it will return significantly by the Series A. It'll get us to a place where we have 1.7 million in ARR. Um, and we have about 500,000 of interest right now uh, for the remaining 300,000, but we're working to close that um, over the next uh, few weeks. So that's the way, and uh, happy to answer any questions. And John, what questions did you have first? I'm going to defer to Beto again. It's not my my area. I applaud your your approach. Um, behavior change is, as you demonstrated, is just super hard. But doing it mindfully, I think, is really interesting. Uh, Beto, do you have comments? Again, you guys are going to have to bear with my shitty voice. Sorry about that. I can't. Um, but no, Bentley. I, I think uh, I, I love I love the background that you're bringing to this. Um, I I really do feel like there are, you're an example of the emerging and and someone in the other uh, session mentioned functional medicine, uh, intuitive eating and the disorders around eating are incredibly neglected. I would say this is part of the continuum of mental health space. Like most people don't consider eating as part of the mental health continuum, but it very much is. Mm -hmm. And when we think about it more as an aesthetic or a nice to have, it gets reg- relegated into this other consumer market for wellness that really doesn't serve the actual chronic nature of it in our communities. And so if anything, I'd suggest that part of what you're tapping into is a recognition that not just in mental health, but way as part of the continuum of emerging health science is really more of a foundational perspective than one that is more commercial or, you know, I, I feel like so many of the um, past uh, examples of people moving into wellness and nutrition have, have done so under the guise of like, you know, GNC and um, supplements that don't do anything or the TV commercial that tells you, you know, lose weight. But you're tapping into not only cognitive behavioral therapy, which is an emerging digital therapeutic, but really tapping into mental health. And so I would encourage you to think about ways in which you can leverage tapping into a healthcare problem, not just into a direct to consumer cell. So I get the need to create traction and go direct to customers, but ultimately having this be part of a provider, I mean, an employer program, um, understanding the mechanics of how it might get into an MCO or a payer program could really be fundamental to shifting how you create scalability of it. I wish I could talk more, man. This is really exciting, but I think you're kind of being creeped out by my voice anyway, so I'm going to stop. No, no, I love it. I love what you're saying. I I actually, you're right on on the money as far as kind of, there are a lot of elements of diet culture, which are pushing against this consumer market and engine that is like things like nutrition supplements, like you mentioned, GNC and all these different, you know, different kind of, uh, solutions that can work on some level, but a lot of the programs, ultimately, we know they have such high failure rate. They're just looking to get people to purchase it every year. And that's how they make a business out of it. And that distrust is really what we're trying to uh, present a, a break and, yeah, and present a different option from exactly. And so I think that from the uh, the payer side and the, you know, kind of having had a background in building companies going B2B and going into large hospital systems and working with payers, I, I think that there's definitely something there. I think what we're focused on is how do we grow? Because ultimately like our designer who's at Headspace and we're very close to the, the, um, the journey that they've been on, right? You know, ever since Andy really started through the TED Talk back in 2010 and, and how they've actually grown into being B2B since the merger with Ginger, it's bigger than um, than their consumer businesses now. And that's where it will go. But I don't think that their B2B business would be as nearly as successful 
if they didn't have the consumer brand that people love, that people trust, that people knew Andy, they knew his voice. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do at the beginning here is do that and then come there that way, because what, what will hurt us if we go to employers right now is utilization rates. You know, utilization will be down at below 10% or below 5%. And then employers won't see the value of it. And then we fail. But if there's already consumer demand for it, now they're they're getting free access to it through their employer. So I love how what do you think? Does that sound like it might jive with kind of your no, your yeah. I, I, that, that, that's similar to what um our approach has been with we are here, which is that you need to establish customer traction and, and actually prove out the value proposition direct to consumer. It's really hard to prove out value proposition that you've scaled. So a lot of what you're doing is understanding how to right size the offering at a scale which is one-to-one with a customer. As you move into other um, payers, you can create tiers of access and engagement that fit with the different modalities that payers and other um, organizations, private insured employers, for example, have. So I, I actually agree with how you're approaching it because most of, if you talk to a self-insured employer or a TPA, a, a third-party administrator, their first question is going to be who uses it and who stays on it. And, and so being able to bring them that evidence is a really part of a big part of your journey. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well said. That's exactly kind of what we're focused on. So, um, so yeah, but thank you for the questions. And thanks for seeing that. I love that. I could tell that you, know, even with the voice, I could tell the, uh, the direct connection. So I appreciate that. And Bentley, I'm interested in the the deal economics. We can take that offline, um, and I'll get with Hall to get your contact info and, and follow up. That Just want to make sure sort of the valuation, what you have left in the round, and and how you're projecting that that future return. But super interesting. I had a similar comment to to Beto's is that really understanding how you're ultimately delivering those outcomes is what Carolyn at We Are Here is doing. So she's first going to employers, Beto said, and then ultimately to a pair. Who then, you know, with your model, it's probably more of a PM, PM kind of, you know, where, where hers is more of a case rate per person that's served. But if you get that, demonstrate the outcomes, then you can have uh, economics towards a covered population with a payer. But I think you're taking the right path right now. You've got to demonstrate who's using it, what benefit they're getting. But well done. That's a really great presentation. Absolutely. Thanks very much, John. Yeah, definitely. We'd love to talk offline and happy to answer any questions on the deal economics for sure. Sure. There's also a partner opportunity in the chat box, Bentley, from John Armstrong about nutrition being a part of their marketing platform at gethealthy.store. Uh, we can make an introduction if you're interested in expanding partnerships in that direction as well. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. Um, I would love to chat. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, John. Great. Um, I think that answers the questions we have for today. I want to thank you, Bentley, for joining us. And uh, Appreciate uh, the presentation and we'll follow up with everybody for next steps here. And John and Beto, thank you so much for your presentation on Cura Health. I think that went uh, very well and had a lot of good interest in that as well. Appreciate your insight into the healthcare market, especially the value base and the telehealth as we see those as growing areas. But with that, we'll go ahead and close it out for today and want to thank everybody for joining us. Great. Thanks, everybody. Nice Thanks to see you all. Well. Thank you. Thanks, guys.